about the JetBrains, it's not focused on JetBrains stuff. So I will be talking about different tools we have in the ecosystem. JetBrains as well, because we are part of ecosystem. And just if you would like to learn more about the tools we do, just come to the booth. I'm like, after the talk, I will be back to the booth and you can ask me any questions about whatever you want. So I call this talk Debug C++, but it's actually not the accurate naming. So it's not about the debugging in the like regular sense. It's about code comprehension with the tooling. So before you even compile the code, so while you're writing the code. So as a quick agenda here, so we'll be talking about the C++ language and about some trick examples which can confuse the tools or can confuse the developers and so why this talk is about. And then we'll talk about the tooling. So let's start with the first part. So talking about the C++, so many of us have heard many times that C++ is tough, it's not that easy for many people, either for coming to the language for the first time or for those who are with the language for 40 years or more. And what I've heard quite often is that people say like the language is complicated to learn, complicated to use, and if you, for example, just to, as kind of example, talk to game developers, what they say is that if you would like to implement a game quickly, do it on Unity, just like throw all your stuff into one directory and the Unity will get you the game and you'll go with it to the market, that's it. With C++, like you have the Unreal Engine, which is a quite a powerful engine for developing games, but the people are somehow afraid of it because you have to learn the C++ to work with it. And that's what makes the, some kind of a barrier to the people who are coming to this area. So C++ 17 is like much more complicated than the language we had in 98. It's more powerful, that's true. You can do more great things in it. But somehow, who here in this audience actually aware of all features of C++ 17 signed up officially more than like a year ago, I said, like officially more than half a year ago. So do you know all the features? I think no. Like maybe so there are some people who know everything. They are great, but still. <laughs> So, and I really like the trend that started in the community recently, probably with the talk of the Herb Sutters, who is trying to force people to make language both easy to write and read and powerful at the same time. And that's really a direction I appreciate. But like, we still keep compatibilities with the old standards, which will be a little bit broken in C++ 20, but that's another topic. So that's a very popular quote from the Bjorn about the C++ and like shorting yourself in the food. And by this link you can find on the Bjorn page, you can find an explanation where he actually confirms that he really say that. That's the page how it's called. And he actually explains what he actually meant there. And the explanation is that this is actually true for all powerful languages, not just for C++. Because when you, with the help of the powerful language, protect yourself from the simple dangers, you can run into harder problems quite easily because you are not expecting them. Because you are just thinking about the easier dangers you are escaping from. And talking about this, so once in a while at ACC conference in April this year, some developers came to our booth and said like that, yeah, that's true, but the developers should suffer. And I was like saying, yeah, probably we should, because when we suffer, we are more focused on the code. We're like not that relaxed. We're thinking about the code we do. But actually, should we really? So can the tools help us to provide better code with a powerful language and suffer a little bit less? And that's what this talk is actually about. Let's think about some examples. I like the example a lot, while it doesn't mean a lot, actually. So this is just the variable template that defines the family of variable, and then some usage for this template. And the story behind the example is very simple. We were testing the feature in the IDE. And how our testing usually works is that we have a bunch of unit testing, and we also have a bunch of manual testing provided by our QA team. And the QA engineer just came with the example, and the IDE was failing on the example, and so, she actually put uh, an issue to our tracker and the developer just looked at the example and said, okay, the ID is failing, I see there is a bug, but what does it actually mean? Because there is no much sense in the example. And that's all about the C++. You can write actually a very complicated code, 
that doesn't actually have a big sense behind it. So we were trying to play with examples, so we put it as usual, like get bald in the C++ code is a typical thing in the C++ ecosystem right now. So we were trying to get bald it with Clang and GCC, but we didn't find anything interesting in the assembly code. And then we tried to simplify the example. So you can see our path here on the slide. So we just write the variable template using some different syntax. Then we remove the template fully. And then we remove the cast. And in the end, we end up with examples that just returns 42. And that's it. That's all that this code is actually doing. And again, that's how our C++ code looks now. And it's easy when you can look at an example like this and just simplify it easily and rewrite it in the way it's written in the end. But sometimes you can't because sometimes you don't see how to go through this path. And what the tooling can do for you, it can help you and it can like drive you through this path. Another example is of course macros. So macros is our like background, our present and unfortunately our future. We can't escape from that. Uh, they are useful in many, many areas, many applications, but still we have lots of problems with that. The biggest problem is that you can just include everything everywhere that's just a text substitution. That's how the macro works. That means that they are not context fully, so you, they are just breaking the context completely. So like you see here in the example, so I have some file which call this xmacro.txt, which is not a valid C++ code or something, it's just a text that lists something. And I have this uh, macro, which when I undef, I actually will lose all the traces of what actually happened here. So after I undefined the macro, I don't know what was happening there. I just got some enumeration in the end. So I don't know where it actually came from. I don't know the, uh, wh where I took it. And actually, there is an issue how to get all the cases. So it's good when the tooling can generate the case or when the compiler can say to you that, hey, seems you are missing some case here. Yeah. But like, that's some smartness that we need to get from the tooling. Because on our own, we can't guess what was actually happening there. We just got some enumeration with unclear values in it from somewhere. And with a macro, you can actually define a class, so you can define types, you can define functions. And here where it has a class def definition, and there is another macro that which is defined actually a mem function member, function call. So, and if these definitions are, like if these declarations are placed in some other file, I don't know where they're coming from. I don't know what is actually happening behind this macro. So I don't know what is this class definition, what is this class which members it has. So I don't know anything about it unless I go to this macro declaration and find everything there and I can like substitute all the macro kills. There are just two, but there could be more and understand what's going on. And another difficulty is the context because macro is actually hiding the actual context from us. You see in this example, I have this magic variable and I have a mac uh, actually the um, I have an if def, and I'm defining this x, which is either an integer or a template, and it depends on the magic value. And this actual magic value affects the code on the right where I have the k, which could be like on the right of the k where I'm assigning something, there is either an integer expression or a template. So the actual type of the k variable depends on the magic. And that's what you can do with your C++ code. And that's what I call breaking the context. This example is from Herb's meta classes proposal, which is the next step of like professional hiders, like from macros that are just hiding some simple declarations to professional hiders, which are the meta classes and the compile time generation actually is. So the idea is that you write the code on top on the right, which is the interface shape, you have the meta class that defines this shape, which actually adds some members to this class. And in the end, after the compilation, you get this struct shape on the bottom. But what you see on your screen when you're writing the code, you see this code on top. You don't know which members it has unless you go to the interface declaration here and actually look at what is there. 
And that could be into some kind of a standard library written with meta classes, for example. So, from my point of view, meta classes are good, so we should have them somewhere in the bright future. But just think for a while that they will be a very professional hiders of what's happening behind your code on your screen. Another example here is overload. So overload on its own is the thing which we have in C++ and which most of us are very proud of. We can overload nearly everything. That's great. That's very powerful. So you can do a lot of great things with the overloads. But let's look at this line of code here. Since I have the uh, fraction stream output operator overloaded, so half of the operators here are the overload version for fraction, and half is just the regular, also overloaded, but in a default way for strings. But they look the same. So how can you guess when you look at the operator if it's doing some default stuff, or if it has an overload somewhere in some header file, in some library? You need to have a way in your tooling to understand that these are different, because this could be useful. Uh, overload, in terms of the function overloads, it's not a complicated stuff. Like there's just a bunch of rules which you have to follow, and you get the uh, correct overload. But like here, this code actually prints two and two. Can you guess it quickly? I mean, like the rules are very simple. You can, I'm, I'm sure. Like, but it takes some time for you to process all the overloads, to build the overload set, to remove all the unnecessary things, to limit it to the proper set, to check for other rules, and to get the correct answer here. And that's the thing that the tooling can do for you. Because that's kind of automatic thing that it has to do for you. That's what the compiler does, why the tooling can't do that for you. And there will be more, because while when we're starting using more const expert or some injected code, or we'll get to the step where we had the meta classes, we'll get more of hiders of this, this kind that will hide the actual code from you, that will, you have to understand what's behind them with some help of the tooling. So the tooling. We have the compiler, which actually provides all the proper code in the end, and you can get what the code is actually in the end after the compilation. That's fine, but what's the typical circle of your development? The, the typical roundabout here is that you just compile, you're linking, like after editing the code, then you test, then you debug, you can use some like printing, whatever, you try to understand what's going on in your code. But let's think, so sometimes the compilation is quite long to wait. That's just the first thing that comes into my mind and prevents from the easy run in the circle. Then sometimes it includes a deploy because you're not always running on a local machine. Then the target platform can be different from the platform at which you are developing at. So you have to deploy to the other platform, to the other remote machine. Sometimes your code is incomplete because you're developing a library. So you just have maybe a bunch of tested tests for a library, but maybe you don't. So you can't easily run the library, yeah? You have to, to, to use it somewhere in some test or application to see what's going on there. And also, like, if we're talking about various static and dynamic e code analysis, so there could be some flowing logic that you can't actually catch with the static or dynamic code analysis because that's not a bug. That's not an issue. That's just some flowing logic that you just somehow is hiding from you. So maybe some bad design or something else. And also, you may be just missing the proper understanding of the code. So that's not the thing which like static or dynamic analysis can help you with. So it can't explain you the code. And so this is what the Herb actually called the transparency that we need from the code. So we need the code to be transparent in that sense. So I guess the answer here is no. And if we talk about actually Herb and where this talk actually started, it started with the Herb's talk at CPPCon uh, last year, where he talked about first on generative C++. So he was talking about all the things coming into the language, of course, about his Metaclass proposals, uh, proposal and many other things. And he was saying that actually the new abstractions that are coming to the language, they are hiders. That's true. And he said a very important thing to me as a person working for the tooling, is that abstractions need to have tool support. So because if they are not toolable, that's quite difficult to deal with them. 
And actually, good abstraction, that's what the good abstraction from his point of view is the abstraction that is toolable. And it's important because if the abstraction you're adding to the language is not toolable enough, it's difficult to cope with it, there will be less developers using it. Because if we look at how the language evolves right now, if we look at all the service that are sur uh, surveys that are running in the community, you can see that most of the people are still using C++ 11 and 14. And sometimes not because they have some compiler or hardware or whatever limitations. That's, that's also the case, but not always. But because the new abstractions that are coming to the language are too complicated, and they're hiding a lot of things behind them, and the people can't cope with them. If we make the abstractions more toolable, if we provide proper tooling, the language adoption will be better. And that's good to know that the C++ committee now understands that because they have a tooling evolution group now in the committee. That's exactly responsible for looking at the language from the perspective of the tooling. And like, as I said, this talk started with the Herbs talk, and that is the exact slide with which I started this talk. That was the slide that Herbs actually uh, showed at CPPCon last year, and there was some kind of a feature list for me. Like he was listing the abstractions in the language per standard and saying about what we need to work with these abstractions. Mostly, it's some kind of a compile time debug and different ways of visualizing the code before you even compile the code. And that's what I'm gonna show you like further in my talk. So, how the tooling could help. The first disclaimer that I have to say here is that that's what I'm showing you here is mostly for IDEs. Tax editors are good to quickly edit the code, but you can't force them to do a lot of smart things because they're not handling the proper code model. So IDEs are exactly the tools for working with the more complicated stuff or for exactly providing you this kind of smartness. So let's start with this uh, kind of macro debugging. So what is macro debugging? What I mean behind it here is understanding the substitution without running the preprocessor. So just type in your code and you can get what's behind this macro. So there are a few things available in the current tooling in the ACA system. So I will be talking about all three. So the first is showing the final replacement. This is just when you simply ask your tool to get a view and to ask the tool, like, show me what's behind this macro after all the substitutions. So the good thing is that you don't need to change your code. You just call for some extra view. And so you don't change the semantic since you don't change the code. It's a separate view. And just in one step, you get the final replacement. That's uh, what we can do in our tools, in C-Line and Resharper C++, and some other tooling is also capable. And what's, that's what, um, yeah. But sometimes you don't need the final replacement because sometimes the final replacement is too deep. Like you can guess that you can have some boost macro somewhere on your way, you don't need to replace it with all the stuff it gets behind. So sometimes you really need to debug in a regular way. So just substitute the macro step by step, unwinding this kind of a stack, and that's what the substitute next step is doing. So we have this kind of feature in WeSharper C++, which can substitute the next step. So it looks like the real debugging. You can stop at any point to look at what you get to understand and then maybe undo or just whatever you want. I should warn you to be careful with that, and a little bit later in a couple of slides I will show you how it can break the context, but as for now. So with the substitute next step, since we have it, we also added the substitute all step, which gets nearly the same result as just show the final replacement, but just substitute it in the real code without a separate view. So just un unwinding stack to the very end. And this is kind of a practical example of what I'm talking about here is that with like boost pp repeat, if I don't know what it's actually doing and I would like to understand, so just to, my code is probably correct, I just want to understand what is happening behind this macro. So I can unwind the stack step by step and I will go finally here or I can just unwind the whole stack to go to the bottom example. I told you that you have to be careful. And that's the example uh, you actually have to keep in mind. So when you're using something like um, counter or line, if you're substituting, you are changing the context. Why so? Let's substitute the second call for the new var. 
What you get there is you get the uh, V1, but now the second, like, I had three usages of new var. The second one is substituted, and now these, these, that was the third one, which is now the second one, it actually has the same value behind it. It also has the variable declaration V1, like, because the counter macro is one in that point. And so the, like, the tooling, if it's capable of these things, if it's aware of the code, it can show you that you probably have some kind of a duplicated declaration. But probably it's not showing this to you, or you have this line in some, like, deeply in your code, some fur, not just on the next line. So this code won't compile, you'll get an error, whatever, but that's what I was meaning, saying that when you substitute in the macro, you have to be careful, because substitution can change the context. Uh, talking about the macro a little bit more, so uh, analysis of the usages of the macro is very important when we are working with macro. And this is an example that usually confuses many, many tools. It confuses nearly every tool I know is confused by the example. Because if you go to the uh, declaration of the func m macro, and you'll go to the func there, and you'll ask for usages, the thing is that most of the tools will show you something like that. So they will list the two first usages, and they will completely skip the third usage, which is here, where I have actually the redefined the func, and there is like some kind of another third call. So the problem is that when with the macro you start with the usage, most of the tools are fine with that, because they just go back, find the declaration, shows you something, which you are requesting. If you are starting with the macro declaration, most of the times you are running into some issues with the usages, because to get proper answer, you have to analyze the whole project, the whole visibility area for this macro, and to understand all the usages. And sometimes it's not uh, quite easy. Um, let's talk about debugging the types. So this is just very similar thing. So debugging the types here is mean meaning understanding the final type, which is behind the code. And so the first thing is that with C++ now, we can avoid writing types at all, explicitly. You can write something like that using alter and decal type. There is no types in this code. They can be inferred. You can guess that the type for the op variable is, uh, is double, or if I use the three and zero uh, as an input parameter for the do operation, I will get the integer type here. And so the tooling right now more or less can show you the infer type here because most of the IDs are building the full AST, so the syntax tree, so they know what's happening there. So there is uh, the kind of examples from different tooling. So there's a C line there, there is a Eclipse, and there is a, like Visual Studio as it, as it was actually announced just this May at Build Conference. So for Visual Studio, it's quite a fresh feature. They didn't have it before. So you more or less can get the type out of there, because actually the tooling uh, is aware of that type. Um, so there is another way to deal with the types, and this is the way we implemented the ReSharper C++ similar to the substitution of the macro. We just implemented the same debugging for the types, when you can substitute the type def or just get the final substitution. An example here is with the boost MPL, if I like, would like to understand the type of high variable there, and I'm not very good at understanding what the boost MPL is doing, I can debug it uh, like and doing some substitutions and get the type of the high in the end with this kind of a debugging and winding the stack. Uh, let's come to some more interesting examples, which is the meta information debugging. And this is mostly about the templates. And this is a very interesting thing because uh, to debug the template, so you have when you like looking at the template instantiation, you would like to understand where it's actually coming from, you would like to understand what you were actually instantiating, and you can find some examples here. So uh, what I actually wanted to show you is that this, is, this one is the like Eclipse and WeSharper, and this is the Civellop. What I like in the Civellop uh, is that they show the separate view, and you can see how these templates were instantiated one by one. So this, like, this is just this example with the like one box, but you can 
see several boxes uh, connected and you can see how it goes and you can see what the arguments were used like just highlighted to you here not just the function signature as shown in Eclipse or uh, in ReSharper. And, but what I like here is that uh, ReSharper uh, and actually Eclipse is showing the documentation command there as well. So if you have some interesting information in the documentation before this template, you will get it in this view as well, So which also can be useful to understand the actual code. Um, I was like, while preparing this talk, I was a kind of a dreamer who was thinking about how we could evaluate more in that, in that direction, so what we can get. And of course, I think the first thing that came to my mind was the const expert which is not mostly handled by tools on the market right now in some smart way. So, uh, like, here is, the, like, here is the combination, actually, of two things. So, I have the two get value calls, which actually instantiate this template with different values, and the contextor is actually uh, working here and giving me two different uh, branches of this if. And uh, what I would like to, give, to get here in like some kind of, a, let's dream a little bit, in ideal world, I would like to navigate from get value here on one or the second line, and the proper branch should be highlighted to me. Something very similar to this, this feature were present in the past in kdevelop. Uh, they were capable of doing the following. When you navigate from the template instantiation to the template itself, the completion in this template were taking uh, into consideration the original uh, place where you navigated from. So you can see some kind of a completion working for this template and situation. It's not there anymore, and as I got from the, from the guys from KDevelop, that that's because they switched to Clang language engine and they had to drop some smart features which they not implemented on Clang right now. Maybe they will bring it back, who knows? However, on build, the Visual Studio showed a very interesting feature. I will try to run the demo here. Is if you look at the example, so they have a template and they have uh, some kind of a usage and uh, somewhere there. But like what they do in this template, so where they don't have any kind of proper completion, they add some tip to the IDE, showing there in the tip which type they will be actually using manually, and then the IDE actually starts completing based on this type that they substituted there. So you can write several in a list, there will be some joint completion. So that's what they showed actually at the build, that's what they are going to release. Uh, that's a very nice feature because you can actually substitute at least manual, you can do, do at least something because most of the time when we have a template, we know what we are going to instantiate it with. We know that we will be using it for like types A, B, C. We can write it there, we can get the completion at least for some common members. That's fine. Um, I hope they really implement it in a Visual Studio in a proper way. So I just show, I just, uh, I was looking at their presentation saying like, wow, finally someone has actually got it. Uh, we had it in mind for a very long time in our tools as well. So we had some prototype, but it's not in production yet. So overloads, let's think about the overloads debug. So debugging function and uh, operators overload it. So they could be different steps, different levels of understanding. So first of all, you, the easiest thing is that you have to somehow to distinguish the overload operator. So just to show that this, this is not the same as this one operator. And it will be ideal if the tool could help you with some kind of an explanation why this overload was actually selected. Because probably it's wrong, probably it's selected in a wrong way. And you have to notice it first and to understand why it was selected and then to do something with it. And sometimes that's a kind of, a, I guess this is the source for many typical issues with the C++ code when the wrong overload is selected and you can just notice it properly on time. Uh, so talking about the distinguishing overloaded operators. So uh, in C line, which this screenshot is taken from, we uh, implemented just the, some kind of highlighting and navigation for the overloaded operators and finding usages for the overloaded operators. So when you place the cursor on the stream output operator here, you see that just half of them are highlighted and the others are not. So just because it's highlighting the overload set, which is there on top. 
So and you can find usages and just navigate to the actual declaration of this overload operator. So at least trying to distinguish it in some way. Talking about the function overloads, so what we can get here? When I'm dreaming about the explanation for the function overloads in C++, so like the algorithm is pretty much simple. So you just build the candidate set, then filter it, and then just check the validity, like you check the equal delete and all the privacy uh, access control things and just get the uh, proper result in the end. So how the tooling can help you? The easiest thing is just to show you what was the candidate set, trying to highlight you what was more or less fitting the candidate set. So that's what the current tooling is capable of. So this is the Visual Studio and the Qt Creator is doing it the same way. Uh, so when you are on a function usage, on a function call, it shows you actually um, which function was called I don't like that you have to list it here, so to get more from the set. So I like, I'm maybe a better fan of the tooling that is showing you the full set like there. So C-Line is showing you all the arguments possible there, highlighting which are possible and which are maybe not. I also like how it's done in like Eclipse and uh, ReSharper C++ because they both shows not only the argument set but the whole signature which is maybe providing more information. And again, ReSharper C++ is showing you the function documentation here as well. So you can get what actually was the overload the, with the full sig signature and the documentation. Um, so yeah, uh, but is it actually enough? So it's not explaining to me why this overload was selected. And that's the thing that is currently missing in the tool set. So I don't know any good tooling that actually explains why this overload was selected. It's kind of a maybe complicated feature because you have to think how to explain, how to do that. But it could be a good feature request to all the tooling you are using, actually. And talking about the overloads, we actually, in the past, implemented this kind of a prototype, which is not in the production, but just a toy feature that we implemented just to try is navigating to similar functions when you are actually breaking the overload and the like you can't navigate easily because that's not not, not a correct uh, navigation but you can try to navigate to some similar functions and to find find out that maybe you are missing some arguments in the uh, actual definition so this is just what is happening here um, okay let's talk a little bit about the includes and all the stuff there. So includes profiler is actually the topic that is very important here. This article was written quite a long time ago already, so it's seven years already, and it was talking about how our code is actually polluted with all these header files included, and how the blow up factor is actually appearing when you just divide the total lines to the total lines parsed because you know you have all your included. The total lines parsed is the total lines you get after all the substitution of the preprocessor. So and this blow up factor could be really very, very big. So like really big for the project that exists for a long time because what we usually do when the product project evolves, we just add in more headers. We're not taking care about if they were included for some other header files already. We don't need that. We just include a header and use the stuff. That's what we usually do most of the time. And so there are diff different ways to cope with that. So of course there is a precompile headers that are there to actually decrease the compilation time because what happens when we get our code polluted with all these unnecessary headers is that the compilation time increases a lot. And precompile headers is a nice thing when you just add something to the precompile header, compile it once and then reuse, but we can't always do that. So sometimes there are cases when we can't just move the stuff to the precompile header or the code is not ours or some other reasons. So uh, would be good to use some other ways. So in uh, ReSharper C++, we've implemented this kind of a profiler. So the idea was actually born from that blog post from the past. The, the guys were talking about the tooling code um, header heroes. These header heroes are was something about 
doing the same stuff that we actually implemented in Rusharper C++ when we just shows you the whole files in the project with all the tags included, with all these lines contribution and with the lines contribution inclusive, meaning all the lines that are actually there after substitution, all the headers. And what you can do, you can just sort, you know, and look at the header, look at the files that are actually bringing you the most lines, uh, thinking about the inclusive column, and then just try to think if you really need them or you can do something with them and you can just open them to see what are they are actually including, is there any round circles or whatever. And the same, probably the job is done by the various optimizers. So many IDEs right now implement this kind of unused include check, which, just show, which actually shows you that this include is not necessary right now, so you could just remove it. Um, there is a include what you use tool, which is Google is very proud of, and they say that it actually helps them to improve the speed of the compilation by 40%. So that's just the tooling based on Clank, which just shows you that these are the unnecessary includes, and it can not only find out and figure like figure out what are, what which includes are not necessary, but also suggest you to replace some of them with forward declarations, just removing these unnecessary dependencies. And uh, the same thing is done by the Includator tool, which is, uh, there is a plugin for Eclipse, that's a static include analysis for Eclipse and for the tools which are based on Eclipse. And uh, it shows you, also shows you the unused includes and also suggests you how you can actually replace includes with some forward declarations and reduce the compilation speed. So these are the tooling that helps you to like deal with the headers and to like somehow to struggle with what's happening there. And that's actually mostly it. There are just uh, a couple of useful links to the Herb Sider talk, which I was really impressed with before like creating this talk, and to this uh, uh, header hero tool, which you might be interested in to read just because to understand how the blow factor is calculated and just some nice text in there. And if you have any questions, we have 10 minutes for the questions. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. I will try to answer anything. Or you all are thinking about the tools you're using. <laughs> yeah, sure. Macro D backslash, okay. Uh, okay, which one? <laughs> ah, you mean um, the context, this one, yeah? So the story is that what I had um, in the original code, I, have, I had two calls for the new var, which is actually using the counter macro, which is just counting the things. And so in the first line, it gives you the value zero. In the second line, it gives you the value one. In the second line, it gives you the value two. Uh, that's how it goes in the original code. When I substitute the second call, the second usage, what I got actually is I got the v1 variable. That's the substitution for the new var macro. But now the counter macro here returns the one because it's like zero, one, if you count like this subsequently. And that means that here it is declaring the same variable, the v1 again, and that's the compilation error. And that what I mean, where, what I meant actually saying that the substitution for the macro in the actual kill, not just looking at the separate view, can change the context. So you have to be careful. Because the biggest issue is that when you have three lines in a row quite close in your code, you probably will be fine. You'll see some highlighting from the editor which is showing you that there is some compilation error or something or you probably like think about it on your own but if these all three usages are located in different code places there is a big chance you'll be failing so in ideal world you just break the compilation you will like you will notice it while compiling but if your compilation like takes a lot on a different remote machine you don't want to run into these issues just debugging this kind of code so just be careful because these macros like counter or line, they don't like to be substituted. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. What 
So uh, what the when I was talking about this uh, includes profiler that we've implemented in ReSharp or C++, the guys are just implementing the, on their own. So they're just manually checking what's going on there because they have the whole knowledge of the project. So uh, I don't know what, uh, like, include what you use is just based on Clang. So we're just using the information from Clang, which is quite powerful in that sense. And I don't know what's behind the includator. I guess something, something the same. So I guess they're parsing the code and trying to guess what's behind there. So, but I'm not sure about the includator. I'm not aware of it really. Yes. Are these tools uh, available only after, uh, after a successful build, or uh, can, can you do some no, check uh, that's, if, that's even the idea. at some time? Yeah, that's the idea. You don't need a build. You don't oh. need to run a preprocessor or a build. You don't need to run a compilation. That's the idea that you get all this information while typing the code. You might have a code that is not compilable right now with your local machine or just at all or whatever. You might even not run the preprocessor, but you get all this smart stuff just because the smart tooling like IDEs, they are actually doing the parsing and resolving the code, which is very similar to the compiler job, but still very different, believe me, because like there are other requirements. But you don't need to compile your code. You just get all these things while you're just typing yeah. the code, and that's the idea. So there is a, a, back, a background thread that analyzes the, the code. Uh. Yeah, so usually the IDEs has their own parser and resolver, and there's some background process running somewhere in the background, parsing your whole code, showing you all the, like, highlighting the code, formatting the code, showing you all the code analysis, smart things, and all the things like that in the real oh. code. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. More questions? Uh, how does uh, uh, all those, this tool mix with, uh, let's say, coding guidelines? You have shown examples which, in a different context, will be viewed as a joke uh, so, or things uh, to uh, absolutely yeah. don't do. <laughs> so uh, do you work for, let's say, uh, let us understand a code written somewhere else which has to be understood somehow and this is a, valuable, is, is a good tool or it's something that, uh, let's say, it's, uh, it's good to use from front up, so uh, as a design, uh, while designing or while uh, writing okay. fresh new code. Yeah, let's talk about the coding guidelines. So uh, from my point of view, so like what's the challenge when you are like implementing a smart tool? You have to deal with every piece of code. So either it's good, either it's bad, either it's compiled or it's non-compilable, either it's using a good like code guidelines or not, so things happen. And that's why it's usually quite difficult because like to implement the, like a quick parser that is handling every piece of code like created by every bright mind in the world. It's kind of complicated, but I still think that the tooling should push some like proper guidelines, like C++ core guidelines that we have right now. It's good when the tooling is pushing it on you. And I mean here not that you just can run some tooling that will show you like this is not compliant with the guideline or this is not compliant with the guideline. I guess that the proper way is that the tooling is showing you right when you are in the tool, in the ID, you are writing your code, and they, like, the ID is like jumping on you saying, like, this is a bad piece of code, don't do that. Just replace it. And that's what we try to do. So with the code analysis that we have in our tools, and many other IDs do that as well. So they are running the code analysis, and they are providing this kind of are called quick fixes. So uh, they are just highlighting you the piece of code and saying, don't do that like change it in this way. And so uh, you can like press whatever shortcut or whatever the ID is providing to you and you just, the, your code will be replaced with the proper one. So this is what I call the pushing guidelines. And this is good because we have to push like developers to use proper guidelines. But we still deal with every code and just trying to push so like the developer can you know, turn off all these code warnings at any time. So that saying like, I don't need your like tips, just turn them off. That's fine. Um, um, do you see uh, in the future a way to have code completion while you type in template code? Yeah, so that's exactly the thing that I was like trying to show that the, what the KDevelop done in the past, what the Visual Studio is trying to do right now is to 
help you with the completion of templated code. Like, and, but to do that, we have to either analyze all the usages or to think about the usages that are even not yet there. And so the developers can help, like in the Visual Studio example, when you can say, like, I will be instantiating the template with this type, and then the ID is providing you the completion. That's fine. And that's much easier way than actually analyzing the usages because with the usages, it's really tough. That's in terms of performance, the task is quite, quite tough, I would say. So especially for C++, where the usages could be like, you know, hidden somewhere. So yeah, from my point, like the approach that the Visual Studio are currently implementing, that we were also dreaming a little bit like in the past, and we had this kind of a prototype similar to what they've done, is that you provide some information about how you will be actually instantiating the template, because usually we know that, mm -hmm. more or less. And uh, so, uh, also, I think that concepts can be helping here because when you have a concept, you can like take the information out of the concept and show the completion, for example, based on this concept. Because if you are saying that like here should be this kind of a concept and it requires some special like uh, function, for example, like in this class, you know that you can complete it because there there is this concept. And so in that sense, yeah, I think that the concept will provide you more opportunities in terms of the tooling providing the completion template and all that stuff. And that will be very important for the matter classes as well, like because otherwise we will be, I guess, that in the world of plain text. <laughs> more questions? I do have one. Sure. <laughs> About includes. Uh, yeah. I, I tested some of, the, uh, of these include reductions, so, so something to reduce the, the includes. And I wasn't happy about that because it removed all the includes that were unnecessary. But sometimes I do want to keep some that are included yeah. by something that I am including. And this is one, one thing that I couldn't find in... Uh, because it's difficult also to define how they... Maybe, maybe there. <laughs> 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 and yeah. the second one is about... Um, also includes, but how to... Um, if there is a tool that can tell you not to include one file, but include another file that is a smaller subset of the w one you are including. Like, in that sense, include what you use, and Includator is doing a good job. And yeah, Peter is waiting over there. <laughs> uh, so this is the CVELOP guy. <laughs> <laughs> Pay attention to him. Uh, so yeah, the tools, they're actually trying to do their best to show you which includes are unused and try to like somehow remove some of them that are really unused. But sometimes, yeah, you're still saying like, no, I would like to keep that. It's just good when the tool can show you at least that we think that this is an unused include. So and if we're not failing uh, in many cases, then you're fine because then you can decide if you use it or not. And so this more or less works. So that's also not a fully automatic approach in any way, I guess. So you will al always have to do that manually. I mean, like, to at least to think if what the tool is suggesting you is a good way or not. So there was mm -hmm. some questions. Just to your question about um, the include problem you had, like, uh, I think include what you use. Uh, actually allows you to define like a mapping database for if include what you use would include that header, please include that one. That's that's doable. With yeah, it's tool. kind of flexible in the way it, you can configure it. Yep. So it's not just removing the includes that uh, it considers like unuseful. So there are some flexibility and configuration steps. I was not talking a lot in details about it, but still it exists there. Yes, I think that's the timer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.